Okay. This is okay. Here we go. Uh, let's start with some sound. I like that sound. That's an escalator at a DC metro stop. The escalator has a plastic element on the side that keeps the metal stairs from grinding against the metal siding, and there's a lubricant to keep it all running smoothly. But when it rains or snows, the lubrication wears off, and it, and it sounds like this. Or it, it sounds like this. That's the escalator at the Farragut North. It kind of sounds like whales mating. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with whales mating on that one. Uh, uh, brace yourselves. This is the, this is the escalator at uh, Columbia Heights. Can you imagine that? Uh, that was best described by Chris Richards, he's the music critic of the Washington Post, as an aviary of chrome-throated ravens greeting you as you descend to your work day. <laughs> All these escalators are basically identical, they have the same basic design, but they each broke in their own way. And the way that they broke gives each escalator its own character. Most people find it annoying, the screeching and scronking of broken escalators, but once you accept that it's not going to change, and trust me, in the DC metro system, it's probably not ever going to change, you can take pleasure in the accidental music of imperfect escalators. Someone even posted a homey plaque that both makes fun of and exalts in the ridiculous moaning of the Farragut North escalator. It reads, It's the stories about the unexpected interactions between people in the built environment that I love to tell on the radio. The lens of who we are through the lens of the things we build. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. 99% Invisible is a radio show and podcast about architecture and design, two disciplines for which the visuals tend to be very, very important, but being constrained solely to audio tells us something about how we can communicate the importance of design in everyday life. People have different opinions about what is beautiful, what is ugly, what is tacky, and so on, but stories are universal, at least if you tell them right. Um, I used to work at a radio station called WBEZ in Chicago, and every day I walked past this building. This is an office building in the old Montgomery Ward complex. It was designed by Minoru Yamasaki, and uh, I have to admit, I walk past it every day. I never even paid attention to it. I could barely bother to crane my neck to look at it. And then uh, someone told me why the building has these really thick uh, concrete corner supports. Um, first of all, they, they kind of open up the floor plan so you can do whatever you want to with the, in the inside. But more importantly, to me anyway, was that the Montgomery Ward Company uh, prided itself on having a, sort of a egalitarian hierarchy. And they didn't want vice presidents fighting over who got the corner office. And so they made a building where there's no possibility of a corner office. Um, you know, it's been converted into condos since then. And uh, in 2006, they added these uh, blue-green tinted glass and everything. And I bet the developers hate that decision with every fiber in their being, wishing they could sell a corner condo, which doesn't exist. But that's the reason why I love this building. And so, and so I win. Uh, <laughs> that story has stayed with me uh, for years now. And I, I think this is one of my most favorite buildings. I mean, it's not my favorite favorite, but if you ask me the question, what's your favorite building, this stupid building pops into my head every <laughs> single time. And um, because I've learned to appreciate its aesthetics more and more as I've told that story again and again. That's why I contend that story is the universal language of design, even more than aesthetics. Don't get me wrong, I love 
I love pretty things, but sometimes prejudice and bias and ignorance and taste just get in the way of me loving a brilliant structure with a great story to tell. My mission is to get people to engage in the design that they care about so they begin to pay attention to all forms of design. When you begin to decode the world with design intent in mind, uh, the world becomes kind of magical. So I'm gonna like crack open and reconstruct a few episodes of 99% Invisible in, in front of you. Uh, so I wanna, when I press a button over here, it's gonna make a sound. And so every time you hear a voice or a piece of music or anything like that, it's because I pressed a button. There you go. You got it? Um, and I have a bunch of buttons over here. And so uh, if I make a mistake, uh, trust me, it's gonna be really charming uh, when it happens. <laughs> and you're gonna be here to witness it. Uh, it doesn't happen on the radio. I don't make mistakes on the radio because I do it all ahead of time, but, but you'll love it. It's not like you'll wish for it. It's, it's kind of like NASCAR, you know what I mean? It's like you don't want there to be a crash, <laughs> but we all know we're there to kind of see crashes happen. Anyway, um, so I'm going to have a few pictures up on the screen, um, but since this is radio, feel free to close your eyes. You don't have to look at the pictures. You don't have to look at me. In fact, I didn't get into radio, so people would look at me. You can lay down. There's plenty of room. Lay down on the floor. Just chill out. I don't know why the lights are on. You can just like chill out. Um, um, I know that the purpose of this uh, conference is to inspire and connect. And as I was putting these stories together, kind of late in the game, I realized that uh, these are a lot of stories about the shit we get wrong, you know, which is a which is not exactly the direct route towards inspiration, but trust me, <laughs> there's going to be inspiration throughout, and then at the end, I'll, I'll bring it home. Uh, because once we recognize the things we do wrong, we make change, and we make things better. So um, I have uh, some stories from the Odas. Um, I just learned that term, the Odas, last year when I was invited to a conference. Um, Hugh Weber invited me to a conference called ODA, and I didn't know what it was until I got there, and I was super excited. That's a great name for a tri-state area. Um, so this, but this first story is not directly from the ODAs. Uh, it's, um, I couldn't be in front of people talking about connection and community um, without talking about uh, Baltimore, which is a, like a national story. So um, I know everyone here knows that the unrest in Baltimore uh, the history goes back well before um, the homicide of Freddie Gray, but you may not know that the inequality in Baltimore is literally built in the landscape and in the infrastructure in ways that, that may apply to the cities you're in, um, and it's important to know about them. We call these the arsenal of exclusion. I think cities are great. There's movement and activity and diversity. But go to any city and it's pretty clear a place can be diverse without actually being integrated. That's Dan Dioka. Over the last few years, Daniel and his two colleagues at Interboro Partners This arsenal is a catalog of stuff inside a city. Today we're only going to focus on the arsenal of exclusion, the weapons that keep people apart. 
in the city of Baltimore, a place that Dan Dioka truly loves. But it's a city that it's been honing its arsenal of exclusion for decades. Our producer and former Baltimorean Sam Greenspan went to look at Charm City's exclusive offerings. In Daniel Dioka's view, it's not the wide Greenmount Avenue that keeps these neighborhoods apart. It's actually the small and subtle and invisible, yet totally intentional things that keep these neighborhoods separate. They're rapidly divided very strict. And so here, you can just see all these physical measures that are deployed to keep people from getting from one side to the other. Just crossing Greenmount on foot is annoying. Two crosswalks in that 1.25 miles stretch. But what's more interesting when we talk about the grid, Greenmount is where the grid ends. The grid is there in Waverly on the east side. Notice that on the right, there's the grid, right? There's 37th Street, 38th Street. We can make a right into Waverly, no problem. But on the left, there's no grid, right? It stops. So notice we're heading right now. We try to make a left, we're being confronted with dead end streets, followers. It's, they're like these uh, security poles that kind of stick in the ground. Oh, here's a wall, right? There's this long row of buildings on houses on the west side of the street. And they're kind of a buffer against the really lovely builder stuff that's just behind. Almost all the roads dead end to houses, and the few streets that do go through are mostly one way streets coming the opposite direction out onto the ring now. There's no way for us to get left into the open shop for a builder. I mean, there has to be some way to get into the neighborhood, but. Well, there is, but on Gilbert's east side, you really have to go out of your way to find a street that will let you in. So it's an hour and a half for a And then once you're inside, you'll notice two things. The houses are super nice, and the roads are super weird. The roads are windy, and they feel disproportionately small next to these houses, giant lawns, and you need a permit to park here. Another interesting one is uh, residential parking permits. In case you're wondering, you do not need a permit to park in the less affluent Waverly neighborhood. But back to Guilford. The weirdest thing about these roads is that it's hard to know what direction they're going. And could you tell if we're east, north, west, or south? It's really so hard to tell. I would imagine we're going south. We're actually going east. So this is Green Mountain Avenue. Since we're outsiders and we don't know our way around Guilford, we were shunted out of the neighborhood on a one way street back out onto Green Mountain Avenue. <laughs> this is one of the one of the streets heading out of the neighborhood. Okay, so we really got out that green out and I thought we were going through it. These physical barriers in the arsenal of exclusion, grids and one-way streets, are not that big a deal. They they can actually be overcome pretty easily, but their placement has meaning. But it's worth noting that other weapons in the arsenal of exclusion that once existed here in Guilford are now illegal, like restrictive housing covenants. Basically, there were housing ordinances that said black people can't live here. Restrictive housing covenants. 
Deoka says that this neighborhood actually pioneered the use of segregationist covenants, housing deeds that restricted occupancy only to white people. This wasn't illegal until 1968. with good cause, but it's interesting to speculate that what this neighborhood would be like if there weren't any of these exclusionary measures in place. And that is into Borough Partners next project, creating development solutions that are not zero sum games. But it all starts with labeling and categorizing the weapons and the arsenal of exclusion and inclusion so we can figure out how to create cities that are more open to everybody. So here's a little end note. Most of the weapons in the arsenal of exclusion create barriers that are hard to see because they're subtle and nondescript, except you know, when they're not. Dan Dioka took Sam to the former site of Hollander Ridge. It's a lower income housing project built way out on the city county line. It has since been torn down, but one artifact of the project remains. I mean, clearly uh, Baltimore has problems beyond physical structure of the city itself, but being able to decode the methods that separate people um, give me hope that we can recognize and uh, change them, change our ways when the urban landscape is adapted or rebuilt or built up for the first time. Um, so uh, continuing on my tour of the stuff that we get wrong, um, this one is, is a little bit more inspirational. So. Uh, um, this is a brand new story. It's, it's coming out this week on the, on the show. You guys are the first person to, to hear it. Um, uh, this is the design of what we get wrong. Um, but when the designer in question is really, really trying to do something right, and I had to do this story because, um, well, it all kind of starts uh, about 12 miles away from here. Um, and, uh, and so that makes me very happy to be here to do this. We've all done it. You go to a store for a pair of socks and you come out with a mega pack of soda. You go out to get shampoo and you come back with a fancy razor. It's hard to stick to what's on your list. I challenge you to go to Ikea and leave only with the thing you came for. Just try to buy a lamp without buying a cutting board. It can't be done. You absolutely knew this, but retail spaces are designed to do this to you. That's my producer, Avery Truffleman. The store is trying to look so beautiful, so welcoming, the items so enticingly displayed in such vast quantity that you cannot help but be drawn in and then drawn towards something you don't need. This is the Gruen effect. The Gruen effect, or sometimes called the Gruen transfer, it's that moment when you walk into a store and the design of the store is so overwhelming and dazzling that you begin mindlessly consuming. The Gruen effect is named after Victor Gruen. So who was Gruen? He's a complicated, complex, contradictory guy. Jeff Hardwick wrote the biography of Victor Gruen, who was born Victor Grunbaum. Born in Vienna in 1904, and he is Jewish in Vienna, leaves in 38. Good call, Grunbaum. And makes his way eventually to New York City. Once in New York, Gruen made a name for himself designing shops and retail spaces. And this was a particular challenge during the lean years of the late 30s. 
People had no money. They just wouldn't go into shops at all. Bakun figured out how to lure people inside, basically by using amazingly appealing window displays. You would go into these window display areas, look at jewelry or handbags or chocolates, and then you'd be tempted and lured into the store. I mean, that's the Gruen effect. Gruen argued that good design equaled good profits. And he, he equates those as one-to-one. -one. If you do more, people are going to stay there longer and spend more money. Gruen started making storefronts all over the country, and he moved from New York to Los Angeles in 1941. Gruen was from the beautiful city of Vienna, which is lined with shops and greenery and places to gather. He saw how most Americans were just riding around in their cars all the time, cut off from the city and from each other. And he knew this problem was even worse in the suburbs. The suburbs lacked what sociologist Ray Oldenburg calls third places. So if you think of your home as your primary place and your work as your second place, the third place is where you go to build community and hang out and just feel connected. Gruen wanted to give the American suburbs that third place. The image of living in closer communication with other people, the image of having the possibility from walk to one place to another. That's archival footage of Gruen from the University of Wyoming. The image of participating in events outside of your own little house has become a desirable factor. Victor Gruen imagined designing an environment full of greenery and shops, an indoor plaza, a modern forum, an island of connection in the middle of the sprawl, one that would only be accessible to pedestrians. Because man, oh man, Victor Gruen hated cars. He rants and raves against cars continually. One technological event has swamped us. That is the advent of the rubber-wheeled vehicle, the private car, the truck, the trailer, as means of mass transportation. And their threat to human life and health is just as great as that of the exposed sewer. It's kind of hard to hear him there with the hiss and the accent, but what he says there is, uh, the threat of cars to human life and health is as great as the exposed sewer. Uh, so Gruen's objective was to get people to park their cars far away from third, third places and walk and stroll within them. As Gruen saw it, his structure would be an architectural panacea. It would remedy environmental, commercial, and sociological problems with the creation of a single building. And so Gruen presented his solution for America, the shopping mall. Gruen actually wanted the shopping mall to be more than just shops. Uh, he wants them to be mixed use. He wants uh, apartments and offices or medical centers attached to the shopping center. He makes cases to have child care facilities, libraries, bomb shelters, a whole range of different functions. And Gruen dreamed and wrote about the enclosed shopping mall way before he ever built one until he finally lands a commission for the very first indoor climate-controlled shopping center. In Edina, Minnesota. Southdale represents an entirely new and dramatic concept in retail merchandising. Planned from its very inception... Southdale Center opened in 1956. It was the mother of all shopping malls. Seriously, Gruen subsequent malls are mostly based off the original Edina concept. When he's doing the first enclosed shopping mall, Southdale, in Edina, Minnesota, what Gruen really emphasizes and what the media ends up celebrating is this massive center court. This court is enclosed and skylighted so that not only the stores, but the shopping sidewalks. In fact, the whole area in front of the stores is air conditioned and temperature controlled, a year round climate of 72 degrees. For Gruen, he's creating a a town square. Southdale Center wasn't quite mixed use, like Gruen imagined. People didn't live in it, and something like a daycare center or a post office couldn't afford that rent. But Southdale did have local shops of all kinds, and plenty of shoppers. Southdale, tomorrow's Main Street, today. 
But from the outside, Southdale Center is not much to look at. I mean, it looks like a mall. It's this ominous, amorphous, boxy shape. In designing the shopping malls, Gruen ended his razzle-dazzle storefronts and window displays. Southdale hardly has exterior windows at all. He moves away from the original concept that, in some ways, they're going to attract by being ostentatious. The draw now is what's inside the mall. In Gruen's mind, it should have pretty much of a blank facade, no signage on it. And then you enter that space and then you walk into the shopping center and that's that sort of transformational grew and transfer moment. Malls are designed as these sort of suburban pilgrimage points, uh, which of course you have to drive to. It's a commitment. You're driving 20, 30 minutes, you're parking, you're getting out of your car, you're walking in. Gruen knew that Americans loved to drive, so the mall was his compromise. You had to walk and stroll once you were inside, but the customers could drive over. So he just hates the automobile, but he never will acknowledge that he's creating these shopping centers, which are largely only accessible through cars. Gruen was right. Americans loved driving to his malls. He got commissions for them all over the country. But over time, Gruen sees that in erecting these malls, these tiny suburban cities, he's helping to drain the real cities. And so for a while, Gruen shifts his focus to urban planning. We want to rescue our cities, which because we have neglected, are threatening to go to pieces. And so Gruen ends up being involved in urban renewal projects where he draws directly on some of the lessons learned in his suburban shopping malls and proposes bringing them back downtown. Municipalities hire Gruen and associates to make their downtowns more like malls. Gruen turns city centers into pedestrian-only spaces full of public art and greenery and lined with shops. He made plans for Boulder, Fresno, Fort Worth, Kalamazoo. Actually, his plan for Kalamazoo became the first outdoor pedestrian shopping mall in the U.S. He even had a concept to turn Fifth Avenue in New York into a pedestrian mall. He gets Manhattan to close down Fifth Avenue for a couple weeks as a test. But a city's downtown is not a mall. It's not so easily quote-unquote fixed, not so perfectly designed and controlled. Cities weren't going to become the pleasant, sterile shopping environments that Gruen wanted them to be. After the riots of the 60s, um, he is, he's shocked and sort of taken aback by those and, and was very much unprepared for them. And I think uh, that may have been somewhat of his reason for the retreat to Vienna. In 1968, Gruen moved from L.A. back to Vienna, back to the greenery and plazas that he had been trying to imitate. But he could not escape his own creation. There's a shopping mall that's being built on the edge of Vienna, and he points to that as how that shopping mall is destroying downtown Vienna. In Gruen's mind, Vienna was already perfectly planned. It didn't need a mall like the broken American suburbs did. As he saw it, his original vision had been completely skewed. After being in Vienna about 10 years, he gives a speech and and writes a paper where he says, I refuse to pay alimony for these bastard developments. Victor Gruen, the mall maker, the mall inventor, became the foremost mall critic. And meanwhile, America's love affair with malls continued. Dude, you want to crash the mall? What's a pretty girl like you doing sitting alone in the middle of this monument to consumerism? Let's go to the mall, everybody! I know, I remember in my own experience, Growing up in New Jersey, when the first mall opened anywhere near me when I was in high school. This is Ellen Dunham Jones. She's a professor of architecture and urban design at Georgia Tech. It was cool to go to the mall, but I mean, literally, it was air conditioned. Mm -hmm. My home wasn't air conditioned. My school wasn't air conditioned. Today, most of us are spending our days and our nights in completely thermally controlled environments. A lot of us are craving being able to be outdoors. In recent decades, our tastes have veered away from climate-controlled environments and away from the indoor mall. 
mall construction actually peaked in 1990. It's been declining ever since, and by 2006 is really the last brand new kind of standard conventional mall that's been built in the U.S. And a new product has entered the scene, a kind of shopping center that the ICSC, the International Council of Shopping Centers, calls a lifestyle center. Lifestyle centers started appearing in the 90s, uh, and they tend to be open air, so in, you don't have that roof anymore, um, but you have a lot of boutiques and a lot more restaurants. Lifestyle centers are malls disguised as main streets. Even though they're full of chain stores, lifestyle centers are sunny and walkable and bustling, the kind of thing that Victor Gruen sort of imagined in the first place. And some of the old style indoor shopping malls are being repurposed. Several of them are being retrofitted into Hispanic community centers. Like in Plaza Fiesta outside of Atlanta. A lot of the stores have been cut up into much smaller mom and pop small shops selling Western wear, selling quinceanera dresses. Plaza Fiesta also has a steady events calendar of performances. And this too is kind of what Gruen had imagined. These sort of community malls are truly places to gather and spend money in the shell of a failed design. Most people, architectural historians especially, that Gruen was a horrible architect. And, you know, I, I, I can see where they're coming from. I mean, his exteriors of his building are uniformly boring. But for Gruen, that wasn't the point. It was the interiors that were really the point. Those fountains, the cheesy statues, the elevator music piped in through all those speakers, those are all part of the Gruen effect. And they helped turn shopping malls into spaces where we felt comfortable staying and spending time and money. A lot of the original indoor malls are abandoned now. I mean, seriously, like some of them are like growing weeds and stuff. Um, there's a website that's sort of a graveyard for dead malls called deadmalls.com. Users can log on and submit stories of the dead malls in their town. There are around 450 malls listed there, submitted as sort of kind of oral histories. In particular, what's interesting, I think, about deadmalls.com is how nostalgic um, a lot of this is, and it, it does make sense. I mean, in so many suburban communities, the mall became the de facto town center. It was really the center of social life other than the school. I would be very sad if all of Victor Gruen's malls were demolished. We should certainly work to preserve at least one. <laughs> at least one. I mean, the most famous mall in, in you know, Minnesota and probably the world is the Mall of America with its roller coaster and its zip line, its aquarium and its water park. But the most architecturally significant mall is its grandfather. It's just a 12 minute drive away in a diner. I went there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I love that water tower too. Definitely keep that one too. Um, so uh, my, my last little story we're going to do here um, is, uh, is, is a thing we get wrong because we don't know any better. But here, is, this is the easiest one. This is the easiest one to, to get because once you know better, we can, we can do something right here. Um, there are basically two principles of design which are important. One is to solve a problem, and the other one is to provide a joy. And few things give me greater joy than a well-designed flag. This is the flag of Canada, of course. <laughs> it's 50 years old. It's a beautiful flag, gold standard. I'm kind of obsessed with flags. Um, sometimes I bring up the topic of flags, and people are like, I don't care about flags. But once you start talking to them about flags, trust me, 100% of people care about flags. <laughs> They're just something about them that work on our emotions. Um, my family dressed up my Christmas presents as flags this year including the, um, the blue gift bag that's dressed up as the flag of Scotland. Uh, I put this picture up online, and, and sure enough, uh, someone left a comment. Uh, you can take that Scottish saltire and shove it up your ass. Uh, <laughs> see what I mean? People are passionate about flags. Uh, that's just what they do. And one of the things I love about flags is once you understand the design of flags, what makes a good flag and what makes a bad flag, you can understand the design of almost anything. So let's start with one of my favorites. It's Chicago flag. The 
five basic principles of flag design. According to the North American Vexillological Association, Vexillological. Vexillology is the study of flags. It's the extra law that makes it sound weird. Number one, keep it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. Before I moved to Chicago in 2005, I didn't even know cities had their own flags. Most larger cities do have flags. Oh, I didn't know that. That's Ted Kay, by the way. Hello. He's this flag expert. He's a totally awesome guy. I'm Ted Kay. I have edited a scholarly journal on flag studies, and I'm currently involved with the Portland Flag Association and the North American Vexillological Association. Ted literally wrote the book on flag design. Good flag, bad flag. It's more of a pamphlet, really. It's about 16 pages. Yes, it's called Good Flag, Bad Flag, How to Design a Great Flag. And that first city flag I discovered in Chicago is a beaut. White field, two horizontal blue stripes, and four six-pointed red stars across the middle. Number two, use meaningful symbolism. The blue stripes represent the water, the river, and the lake. The flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. The red stars represent significant events in Chicago's history. Namely, the founding of Fort Dearborn on the future site of Chicago, the great, uh, the great Chicago fire, the World Columbian Exposition, which everyone remembers because of the White City, and the Century of Progress Exposition, which no one remembers at all. Number three, use two to three basic colors. The basic rule for colors is to use two to three colors from the standard color set, red, white, blue, green, yellow, and black. The design of the Chicago flag has complete buy-in with the entire cross-section of the city. It is everywhere. Every municipal building flies the flag. Like, there's probably at least one store in every block near where I work that sells some sort of Chicago flag paraphernalia. That's Wet Moser from Chicago Magazine. Today, just for example, I went to get a haircut, and when I sat down on the barber's chair, there was a Chicago flag on the box that the barber has kept all his tools in, and then in the mirror, there was a Chicago flag on the wall behind me. When I left, a guy passed me who had a Chicago flag badge on his backpack. It's adaptable and remixable. The six-pointed stars in particular show up in all kinds of places. The coffee I bought the other day had a Chicago star on it. It's a distinct symbol of Chicago pride. When a police officer or a firefighter dies in Chicago, often it's not the flag of the United States on his casket. It can be the flag of the city of Chicago. That's how deeply the flag has gotten into the civic imagery of Chicago. And it isn't just that people love Chicago and therefore love the flag. I also think that people love Chicago more because the flag is so cool. A positive feedback loop there between great symbolism and civic pride. So I moved back to San Francisco in 2008 and I researched its flag because I had never seen it in the previous eight years I lived there and I found it, I am sorry to say, sadly lacking. <laughs> no, it, it, it's gonna get worse. <laughs> Well, let me start from the top. Number one, keep it simple. Keeping it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. It's a relatively complex flag. Okay, the main component of the San Francisco flag is a phoenix representing the city rising from the ashes after the devastating fires of the 1850s. A powerful symbol for San Francisco. I still don't really dig the phoenix. Uh, Design-wise, it manages to both be too crude and have too many details at the same time. And if you were trying to do that, I don't think you'd succeed. But, and it looks bad at a distance, but having deep meaning puts that element in the plus column. Behind the phoenix, the background is mostly white, but the flag also has a substantial gold border around it. Which is a very attractive design element. I, I think it's okay. So. Uh, <laughs> Here come the big no-nos of flag design. Number four, no lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind. Underneath the phoenix, there's a motto on a ribbon that translates to gold in peace, iron in war, plus. And this is the big problem. It says San Francisco across the bottom. If you need to write the name of what you're representing on your flag, your symbolism has failed. The United States flag doesn't say USA across the front. But in fact, country flags, they tend to behave. So hats off to South Africa and Turkey and Israel and Somalia and Japan and Gambia. There's a bunch of country flags that are just 
fantastic. They obey good design principles because the stakes are high. They're on the international stage. But city, state, and regional flags are another story. There is a scourge of bad flags, and they must be stopped. <laughs> the first step is to recognize that we have a problem. A lot of people tend to think uh, that good design is just a matter of taste. And to be honest, sometimes it is. But sometimes it isn't, OK? So here's the full list of NAVA design principles. The five basic principles of flag design. Number one. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Number two. Use meaningful symbolism. Number three. Use two to three basic colors. Number four. No lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind. Because you can't read that at a distance. Number five. And be distinctive. All the best flags tend to stick to these principles. And like I said, uh, most country flags do a pretty good job. But here's the thing, if you showed this list of principles to any designer of almost anything, they would likely say that these principles, simplicity, deep meaning, uh, having a few colors, uniqueness, uh, don't have writing that you can't read on it, all these principles apply to them too. But sadly, good design principles are rarely invoked in US city flags. Our biggest problem seems to be that fourth rule. We just can't stop ourselves from putting the names of our cities and generic looking municipal seals on our flags. Here's the things about municipal seals. They are meant, they were designed to be on pieces of paper, like where you can read them, not on flags flapping 100 feet away in the breeze. So here's a bunch of city flags. Um, vexillologists call these SOBs, uh, seal on a bed sheet. Um, and it, <laughs> And, and if you can't tell what any of these cities are, that's kind of the problem. I mean, Anaheim seems to have figured something out, but uh, other than that, um, these flags are everywhere in the United States. Um, the European equivalent of the municipal seal is the city coat of arms. And here's a lesson where we can how, how, to, how to do something right. So this is the city coat, this is the coat of arms of the city of Amsterdam. Now, if, Amsterdam were in the United States, and believe me, sometimes I wish Amsterdam was in the United States. Um, the flag would look like this. <laughs> um, but instead, the flag of Amsterdam looks like this. It takes the key elements of the escutcheon and turns it into the most badass city flag in the world. <laughs> instead of that blue field and just saying Amsterdam on the bottom which we tend to do. And because it is so badass, the, the flag and the, uh, the crosses, um, you see them everywhere in Amsterdam, just like Chicago. So even though seal and a bedsheet flag are, are boring and painful to me personally, uh, nothing can quite prepare you for one of the biggest train wrecks in vexillological history. This is the flag of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the number five rule is be distinctive. <laughs> and they nailed that one. It was adopted in 1955. The city ran a contest and gathered a bunch of submissions with all kinds of designs. And an alderman by the name of Fred Steffen cobbled together parts of the submissions to make what is now the Milwaukee flag. It's a kitchen sink flag. There's a gigantic gear representing the industry. There's a ship recognizing the port, the clock tower. There's a huge stock of wheat to pay homage to the brewing industry. It's a hot mess. And Steve Kodas, a graphic designer from Milwaukee, wants to change it. It is, it's, it's really awful. It's a misstep on the city's behalf, to say the least. <laughs> But what puts the Milwaukee flag over the top, for me anyway, almost to the point of self-parody, is that on it is a picture of the Civil War battle flag of the Milwaukee Regiment. So that's the final element in it that just makes it that much more sort of ridiculous that there is, you know, a, a flag, flag design the flag. within yeah. the design of the Milwaukee flag. Now, Milwaukee is a fantastic city. I have been there. I love it. Um, the most depressing part of this flag, though, is that there have been two major redesign contests uh, for the Milwaukee flag. The last one was held in 2001. 105 entries were received. But in the end, the members of the Milwaukee Arts Board decided that none of the new entries were worthy of flying over the city. They couldn't agree to change that thing. 
<laughs> That's discouraging enough to make you think that good design and democracy just simply do not go together. But Steve Kotis is going to try one more time to redesign the Milwaukee flag. I believe Milwaukee is a great city. Every great city deserves a great flag. So Steve wasn't ready to reveal his flag yet. Um, there's, a, there's a trick to sort of gathering support and then produce, you know, uh, making a redesign. But here's the trick, if you want to design a good flag, kick-ass flag like Chicago's and DC's, uh, which also has a great city flag, you start by drawing a one by one and a half inch rectangle on a piece of paper. Your design has to fit within that tiny rectangle. Here's why. A three by five foot flag on a pole 100 feet away looks about the same size as a one by one and a half inch rectangle seen about 15 inches from your eye. You'll be surprised at how compelling and simple the design can be when you hold yourself to that limitation. Meanwhile, back in San Francisco. Oh, is there anything that we can do? I like to say that in every bad flag, there's a good flag trying to get out. The way to make San Francisco's flag a good flag is to take the motto off, because you can't read that at a distance. Take the name off, and the border might even be made thicker, so it's more a part of the flag. And I would simply take the phoenix and make it a great big element in the middle of the flag. But the current phoenix has got to go. I would simplify or stylize the phoenix, depict a big wide-winged bird coming out of flames, emphasize those flames. Uh, the San Francisco flag was designed by Frank Camara based on Ted Kaye's suggestions. I don't know what he would do if he was completely unfettered and just went to town on a whole new design. Fans of my radio show and podcast who've heard me complain about bad flags before have <laughs> sent in other suggested designs. Uh, this one's by Neil Musset. Uh, uh, both are so much better. And uh, if, if they were adopted, I'm sure I would see the flag uh, around town. In my crusade, to make the flags of the world more beautiful. Many listeners have taken it upon themselves to redesign their flags and look into the feasibility of getting something new adopted officially. I gave a talk in Sioux Falls uh, last year <laughs> and discovered that they were, they're right on the edge. They have 150,000 people. They did not have a city flag. And so uh, I gently admonished them for that uh, oversight. Uh, and uh, this prompted uh, Hugh Weber of the aforementioned ODA conference uh, to host a flag design competition for Sioux Falls. Uh, I was one of the judges. This was the winner. Um, I think it's great. It uses the sunshine symbol of the South Dakota uh, original flag and incorporates the falls as the pink quartz. I like it a lot. Um, but here's the deal. If you see your city flag and like it, fly it. Even if, it even if it violates a design rule or two, I, I don't care. But if you don't see your city flag, um, maybe it doesn't exist. But maybe it does, and it just sucks. And I dare you to join with you, just like you, <laughs> and you know, mount an effort to change that. As we move more and more into cities, the city flag will become not just a symbol of the city as a place, but also a symbol of how the city considers design itself. Especially now, as the populace becomes more design aware, and I think design awareness is at an all-time high, a well-designed flag can be seen as an indicator of how the city regards all of its design systems, its public transit, its parks, its signage. It might seem frivolous, but it's not. Often when city leaders say, we have more important things to do than worry about a city flag, my response is, if you had a great city flag, you would have a banner for people to rally under to face those more important things. I've seen firsthand what a good flag can do in the case of Chicago. The marriage of good design and civic pride is something we need in all places. The best part about municipal flags is that we own them. They are an open source, publicly owned design language of the community. If they are designed well, they are remixable and they are adaptable. We could control the branding and graphical imagery of the cities we live in with the right flag, but instead of having bad flags that we don't use, we cede that territory to sports teams and chambers of commerce and tourism boards. Sports teams can leave and break our hearts. Some of us don't like sports. Sometimes they make us build new stadium we don't need. Uh, <laughs> and tourism campaigns can just be cheesy, but 
A good flag is something that represents the city to its people and its people to the world at large. And when that flag is a beautiful thing, that connection is a beautiful thing. So maybe we can have all the city flags as great as Hong Kong's or Portland's or Trondheim's, and we can do away with the bad flags like San Francisco and Cedar Rapids and Milwaukee. And maybe when all the flags are fixed, we can do something about Pocatello, Idaho, which according to the 2004 survey of the North American Vexillological Association has the worst city flag in North America. Yeah. There's a trademark symbol on it, even. So someone forwarded me a newspaper article uh, claiming that one of the reasons why St. Paul was better than Minneapolis is because St. Paul has a better flag. Um, so I thought we would compare here and decide in the finally. <laughs> um, so I, I think they both, I, I could love both these flags. So I go with it, you know. Maybe it doesn't have to say St. Paul on it. That one really, that's one of the ones that gets into my, under my skin. Uh, but here's the thing, those are great. Um, you can love those flags. We have bigger fish to fry in the Yodas, okay? Uh, it's your state flags, my friends. <laughs> you're, you li these are beautiful states, beautiful states, great iconography. Uh, just, there's a lot to work with here. Let, let, let's get some better flags, okay? Just, anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks to the Bush Foundation for having me. I had a great time, thanks.